بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها النبي إذا طلقتم النساء فطلقوهن لعدتهن وأحصوا العدة The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asli wal-Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Surah 65 of the Holy Quran is known as Surah Al-Talaq, the Surah of Divorce. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala names a chapter talaq, it gives us an understanding of the seriousness of the act of divorce and the seriousness of what surrounds the laws of divorce. Indeed, there are three main surahs which talk about the laws and the act of divorce. Surah al-Baqarah, Surah al-Nisa, and of course, Surah talaq. Surah Talaq gives you an understanding of the laws, an understanding of your roles, an understanding of your duties. For as we know, the laws of divorce are not only for the religion of Islam. When you examine all the world religions today, you'll find that each and every one of them has their own laws when it comes to the world of divorce. None of us enter a relationship looking to get divorced. Whenever we enter a relationship, our hope is that that relationship is a relationship which is going to provide us with happiness, provide us with success, provide us with that glory that we seek in our life. Nobody goes towards their marriage day looking to get divorced. Each and every person when they get married seeks to have that day in which they're able to find happiness in their life. But without a doubt, one thing that we do realize is that we're going to be tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in different ways. Some of us may be tested with our wealth. Some of us may be tested with our health. Some of us may be tested with our children. And some of us may be tested with our marital relations. As in if Nabi Nuh and Nabi Ibrahim and Nabi Lut and the Holy Prophet and the second Imam and the ninth Imam can all be tested in their marriages, then there's no doubt some of us will be tested in our marriages as well. When you look at the prophets and the imams, you'll find that many of them were tested in their marriages. As in you would think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not test the holy prophets with his marriages. Yet when you look in Surah Al-Ahzab or in Surah Al-Tahreem, you find that the holy prophet was tested a great amount with his marriages. Nabi Nuh and Nabi Lut, their wives died as disbelievers at the end. You therefore find that each and every one of us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will test us in different ways. Some of us may be tested with our marriages. We may be the wealthiest people, the healthiest people, the nicest people. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides that the area He wants to test us is in our marriage life. And therefore you find without a doubt that some of the greatest personalities were affected with moments which nearly reached talaq. As in the Quran you find that there are prophets of God like Ibrahim who had to juggle in their marriages. That there were moments where Sarah and Hajar could not live together. Therefore when you find someone like Nabi Ibrahim tested with the issue of marriage, likewise we're going to be tested. 
What you find in our communities today, many people are asking the question, why is there such a rise in talaq? Every other day you hear that a person got married a few months later, the couple got divorced. And sometimes you hear the other way. You hear people who've been married for many years, who you never expected that you would hear talaq in their relationship. They've got two children, three children, four children. On the outside, everything seems rosy. And then all of a sudden you hear that the two of them have decided to divorce. When we hear this, many times people ask the question, why is there this rise in talaq in our communities? And there may be a number of factors, no doubt, as in one of the factors may be the media influence on many of our youth, correct? As in you find the media today is telling you, you know what, if you want a divorce, phone this number and you'll get a quick divorce, correct or no? On Google, there are even websites which tell you quickdivorce.com, correct? Call us and we'll finish the marriage off for you. When you look at the television, there are certain respected personalities. When you hear they get divorced, you think to yourself, well, if they got divorced, why can't I get divorced? You hear of certain respected personalities in the community. When you hear they get divorced, you think, why can't I get divorced? Therefore, number one, the media is an issue, no doubt. Number two, you find also at the same time, there is a rise in our communities of prenuptial divorces. What do we mean? How many nikahs have you heard of recently where the mother-in-law steps into the Maulana's office? And she comes to me and she says, listen, in the contract, I want my daughter to have the right for divorce. You say to her, what do you mean? She says, well, can she have the right for divorce if we are in included before the marriage takes place? We say, yes, she can. Say, very well, that's what I want then for my daughter. I want her to have the right to divorce at any time. When you ask her why, she says, have you heard how many cases there are? where there are daughters who cannot get out of marriages because the husband has oppressed them. And they are right, as in there are certain husbands in this world, they make shaitan look like a sensible person, yes? As in there are certain husbands in this world, when you look at them, he will say to the lady, I will not divorce you even if the imam comes and tells me to divorce you, yes? I will make you suffer. The Quran talks of that group of people by calling them the Mu'allaqat. Yes, the Mu'allaqa. The Mu'allaqa is the one who is connected to the marriage because of oppression, not anything else. He is angry that she wants a divorce. So she turns around and says what? That I want to end this. He says, very well, I won't end this. And all the power is in my hands. And Islam doesn't give you any power, which in itself is a myth, by the way, and I'll come to that in a moment. And so what do the mother-in-laws do? They stick it in the daughter's head from the beginning. Listen, I want you to have a prenuptial agreement that you're allowed to divorce him at any time. You find that when that daughter has in her head psychologically, I can divorce him at any time. That means anything that happens, I'll call a divorce, correct or no? Therefore you find, yes, there are cases, no doubt, that you may have an abusive husband, an oppressive husband, and there is no doubt as well that some of our respected leaders have left a lot to be desired when it comes to helping ladies in our communities. They see a lady bruised, black, all over her face, bruised, blue, all over her body, and he says to her, be patient with him. What do you mean be patient? What else does the girl have to take? As in you find that unfortunately, you find in our communities today, there are certain people, their physical abuses of their wives will prolong their day of judgment, no doubt. Who did you see abuse your wife? You saw Rasulullah abuse Khadija or Imam Ali abuse Fatima. When you claim to be a lover of Al Muhammad and you abuse your wife, I beg you, don't say you're a lover of Ahl al-Bayt. Go and join another school. There are other schools for that. A person who abuses their wife has got nothing to do with the message of Rasulullah. Let's make that clear from the beginning of this discussion. A person who takes a girl from another family and abuses her, never call yourself a lover of Al Muhammad. Get out. Don't join the schools. Go somewhere else. Therefore, what do you find? You find Allah named the chapter of the Quran Talaq purposely. Do you know how many Muslims, by the way, have not read Surah Al Talaq? If you come to a Muslim today, he said, You know there's a Surah called Talaq? He's like, listen, buddy, I just about finished Kawthar. You want me to finish Talaq? There are many Muslims in the world today who haven't even come across the Surah. And they come to you, they ask you, so what's the laws of Talaq? Habib, there's a Surah in the Quran called Talaq. Why do you need to ask me? There's a whole Surah called Talaq. Go read it. As in, it's unbelievable how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a book with the best index, yet most of us don't know five Surahs of that index. A whole Surah called Talaq. 
to allow you to reflect what are the laws of talaq, what are the conditions of talaq, what are the moral benefits but disadvantages of talaq at the same time. You therefore find that the issue of talaq Allah wanted to address. No doubt there are certain hadiths that put you off talaq straight away, correct or no? As that when you hear that the arsh of Allah shakes when there's a divorce, a person automatically thinks I'm never going to get divorced. Or when you hear the hadith, a woman who asks for a divorce for no reason will never smell Jannah. The woman then thinks to herself, you know what, let him continue to beat me because I've heard that hadith. Or when you hear the hadith, the only halal which is allowed, yes, but is frowned upon and hated by Allah is talaq. Then a person thinks that there is no way I can have a talaq. Nor does this lecture want people to be encouraged to perform talaq, yes? Because sometimes a person thinks when they examine Surah Al-Talaq, they examine straight away that the speaker is saying, everyone go and get divorced. Not at all. But what we're trying to understand is what was Islam's worldview on talaq? Did Islam want us to find divorce normal? Did Islam want us to attack divorce and never come near it? Or was there a middle ground Islam sought to have a balance in? Let me examine this in the following stages. What's the difference between Judaism, Christianity and Islam on divorce? And why is the Catholic Church until today very strict against divorce? Number two, what was Islam's opinion on divorce? And did Rasulullah marry any ladies who were divorcees? And what lesson does that give us in our communities today? Number three, why are there divorces taking place? And what are some of the issues that need reform? Number four, if I come to my wife and say to her, Talaq, 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 does that count as a divorce? And why is the school of Ahl al-Bayt so strict on the two witnesses in Talaq? Number five, can a woman ask for Talaq? And what is the concept of the khul'a divorce and the mubarak divorce and the hakim shara' divorce which allows the woman the right for talaq? Number six, did the holy prophet ever get a message from Allah to divorce his two wives? Which two wives? And what had they done to him? And number seven, how did Khadija act as a role model to every wife on the 10th of Muharram? in the way that that wife and husband relationship could be the best of relationships. Let me examine this and dissect this topic in complete depth. When a person comes to studying any law in Islam, there is a need to compare our opinion with other religions. Someone asks why? The reason is we live in a cosmopolitan world. When we live in a cosmopolitan world, there are two types of Muslims. There's the one, the only people he ever sees or she ever sees, are people from their community. Those people live in a cuckoo land, yes? If you ask him, who's your friends? Is all his friends or all her friends are only followers of Ahlul Bayt? You say to them, don't you have any friends from other communities, any acquaintances? No. Have you been to meet other people in dialogue? No. The Quran didn't want Muslims to be rigid, narrow-minded people. The Quran wanted Muslims to be people who explore, people who read, people who analyze, people who engage in dialogue with other religions. When I come to an issue in the Western world today, much of the West believes that Islam is oppressive to women, correct or no? As in how many times you read newspaper articles which say, Islam is barbaric against women, Islam oppresses women. When I realize that the world is saying Islam is against women, I need to show that actually when you read the laws of Islam, you'll see that we gave more rights to women than many other religions. Someone says how? Look at Judaism and Christianity on the area of talaq and compare it to Islam. Christianity is arguably the strictest religion when it comes to divorce. And especially the Catholic Church, correct or no, as in anyone who knows, the Catholic Church, there is two areas they are never changing in. And you're lucky if the change occurs. One of them is contraceptives, yes? Today in Africa, how many people do you have who have AIDS? Why? The Catholic Church is saying you can't use contraceptives. Excuse me, what do you mean you can't use contraceptives? We are living in a world where if people are promiscuous with each other, there is definitely going to be viruses. No, we're not allowed to prevent what God has willed. God is telling us use your heads as well, correct? The one area is contraceptives. The second area is what? 
the second area is divorce the Catholic Church until today will stick by Jesus' line that divorce can be done if the woman has committed adultery otherwise no other reason you move on and marry someone else it's as if you've committed adultery say excuse me but what if the two people don't get on with each other as in these are two human beings with different backgrounds different emotions no once you are married in the eyes of God you have to stick with that same person someone turns around and says but wait so you're saying to be my daughter when she gets married to someone if she doesn't like him she has to stay with him for the rest of her life yes why because you are disobeying God if you get divorced I said why do you think King Henry VIII the poor guy decided you know what let's get out of here yes King Henry VIII thought to himself listen I need to get divorced these guys aren't allowing me he done something which I think many of us have wanted to do in our life. Let's form a new school which suits us, yes? He thought to himself, you know what? If they don't allow me to get divorced, I'll get divorced myself. And they formed a new school in Christianity. And that's why the Pauline privilege, what does it say? The Pauline privilege says there's no divorce. There may be annulment, which means what? Which means there was no marriage at the beginning anyway, but there's no divorce. Christianity therefore on the one hand part of it says not all but part of it says no way divorce you're stuck in this marriage forever do you know what that leads to that leads to what relationships behind the back yes or no because if I can't get out of the relationship what do I do I have mistresses on the side I'm still married mashallah in the eyes of God yes but I've got one here and I've got one there but I don't want to hurt God so I'll have them on the side so my wife is not hurt Christianity went one extreme it said divorce is difficult Judaism the schools differ the Shammai school and the Hillel school differ the Shammai school what do they say they say similar to Christianity you can't divorce except in the case of adultery the Hillel school go the other extreme what do they say if you're not happy with your wife's dish that day divorce her say, excuse me what do you mean See, if the food was not nice, divorce her. There's no, no other reason. You don't need to give another reason. Yes, but wait. God surely will be disappointed in me if my wife has cooked a dish that day and I'm disappointed and I say to her, you know what? Talik, talik, talik. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, excuse me, you took this lady from their house and now you turn around because she cooked the, uh, the food not like your mom cooked the food and you want to divorce her? You find Judaism is split. Judaism, further than that, it finds it very difficult if you divorce your wife it's very difficult to come back to her yes to come back to a wife who you've divorced is difficult and even between Christianity and Judaism the idea of marrying a divorcee for many years was difficult therefore the question arose what was Islam's view did Islam say no way divorce did Islam for example say yes divorce as you want no Islam took the middle ground Islam first and foremost recognized that these two may have not known each other before correct as in how do our marriages really work the two of them may know each other for six months and you know that six month period is the best period of your life correct because you know you can drop her home and go and chill with your friends yes there's no nagging when are you coming home when are you gonna be there where are you with everyone loves their engagement period yes you have your fun with your girl and then you take her home and you say mashallah i'm gonna miss you get out of here quickly baba let me go back to my friends the person enjoys that engagement period but then when the two of them get married to each other we know very well they've come from different backgrounds we know very well she's moved into a new house it's not an e equals mc squared relationship these are two human beings with two different emotions two different backgrounds if there isn't sabr at the beginning then there's a chance the two of them may not click sometimes islam says you may be good friends but not good husband and wife correct there are some people out there good friends but there's no click physically if there's no click physically imagine the husband and wife are good friends but there's no click physically if Islam said that you can't get divorced that means you're telling me I have to live with someone the whole of my life I'm good friends with them but I don't click physically what do I do as in I can't come near the person or she can't come near me if Islam said it's haram divorce is wrong then I have to stick with someone I don't like we will end up committing zina correct or no she'll go her way I'll go mine Islam said no Islam said we want the both of you to live in peace but we also recognize that you're human beings and you have different faculties and therefore you may come to a conclusion that you can't live with each other 
Islam therefore took the middle ground that divorce is something which is allowed but Islam reminded its followers what that the one act which shakes the arsh is divorce why because Islam wanted to remind its followers divorce number one can have a domino effect on the community when you two divorce it's not just two who are divorcing the families then are sensitive with each other the community then has to break up friendships because my cousin divorced his niece so Islam said try and reflect your community makeup and you know how much Islam concentrates on the community number one your community makeup it might be destroyed number two at the same time if you have children those children grow up without a father figure in their life all those children grow up in a single parent home that child grows up without the discipline they may need the father moves on to a new life that's why be careful when you get married don't just divorce while there's children running around today you have people two kids three kids and they find it normal they turn around and they say what they turn around and they say that why shouldn't I get divorced you reply back to them by saying but Baba if you get divorced what's gonna happen you're gonna leave this child to grow up there's no father figure in their life that child doesn't have that social stability that child doesn't have that role model at home it's not that easy just to say okay us two don't get on how about the children sometimes the sacrifice may need to be made for the sake of the children therefore Islam said divorce is allowed but try and reflect on the permanent effects of divorce correct or no try and reflect that that divorce that has taken place that may damage the very fabric of the society within which you live but did Rasulullah want to put a stigma on those who are divorcees no you see in our communities today if someone's a divorcee no one goes to approach them for marriage you find people turning around and saying that girl's a divorcee okay she's a divorcee what she done wrong what she done wrong oh do you know what I heard don't give me what I heard in a divorce both are the problem not one we love to hear one side of the story it's our nature gossip oh, I can't I can't wait for another divorce let's hear what happened correct we love to hear one side mark my words in a divorce yes unless you're a prophet of Allah or a ma'soom there's two sides to every story correct or no don't put the blame on everyone they turn around and say well that girl's a divorcee that girl may be a divorcee number one she may have done nothing wrong number two even if she did do something wrong how do you know she hasn't done toba and changed how do you know she didn't do istighfar as if you're an angel flying in the earth and everybody else is a devil yes mashallah some of them <laughs> he's an angel walking around and he's saying you know what she's a bad girl and have you seen yourself in the mirror or no look at yourself then you'll see what a bad person is Rasulullah purposely married an ex-divorcee purposely why because the Arabs used to say marrying a divorcee is embarrassing stay away from a divorcee his cousin Zainab was married to his stepson Zaid Rasulullah had adopted a young boy by the name of Zaid many times people ask me adoption in Islam is it allowed or no of course it's allowed Rasulullah adopted I have a message on this from five years ago adoption in Islam Rasulullah adopted Zaid when he adopted Zaid Zaid married who his cousin Zainab now you know very well Zainab was from the aristocracy Zaid was a servant Rasulullah wanted to break the idea that you know what there is an aristocracy and there are people who are low everyone is the same in the eyes of Allah but the two of them couldn't get on and Rasulullah could not force them to get on yes I can't force my daughter to love the person I can't force my cousin to stay in a marriage so when they got divorced who married her Rasulullah married Zainab the Arabs at the time to marry a divorcee or to marry the ex-wife of your adopted son was seen as a cultural taboo you see other than Bibi Khadija every other marriage of Rasulullah was for a political or legal reason Bibi Khadija is the only marriage Rasulullah married because of his love for her the rest of them are either political or legal this one wanted to introduce a law what's the law the law that this one wanted to introduce was that a divorcee should not be a taboo in your community if a girl gets divorced at 20 are you serious that she has to wait till 37 38 until someone marries her 
Are you serious that a girl who's 25 gets divorced and the whole community says, you know what, don't approach her. Why? She's divorced. But what's she done haram? Has she left Ahl al-Bayt? Has she left the love of the Ma'sumeen? Has she dishonored her parents? No. Maybe her and the person, they didn't get on. He was from one country, she was from another. The cultures were different. He was from one country, she was from another. That He was homesick or she was homesick. It can happen. Rasulullah therefore married an ex-divorcee. And you know what's good about Muslims? Muslims are very funny. The parts of Rasulullah they want to take, they take. The others they re reject, correct or no? We love the areas that suit us. Rasulullah, if there's something in his life that suits us, we follow. But when you tell Muslims, for example, you tell them, Rasulullah married someone older than him. Why don't you marry someone older than you? No, 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 I can't. I, but Rasulullah is sunnah. I have to follow a sunnah, correct? Or Rasulullah, for example, married a divorcee. Will you marry a divorcee? Divorcee, you must be joking. She has a black cross on her. Which black cross? Yeah, who, who put a black cross? Who have you become? Maliki Yomadeen? If you're Maliki Yomadeen, put a black cross. Yes? Otherwise, you are no one to put a black cross. Therefore, Rasulullah wanted to show Islam was balanced on divorce. Islam did not want to put a taboo on divorce. Islam wanted divorce to approach it rationally. But likewise, Rasulullah made it clear to us that before you examine divorce, ask yourself, what are normally the reasons behind the divorce? Please understand this line. Many times when we look at our communities today, many people are jumping to the issue of divorce without asking what are the reasons behind the divorce? Why are our youth getting divorced? What could be the reasons? And there are many reasons. And there's a few which we need to bear in mind as soon as possible. And this goes out to the youth and the elders, yes? Because today, divorce, there's no difference between the two. You could be 21 or you could be 51. Both, it applies the same. The first issue that's affecting our communities, which is leading to talaq, the husband or the wife are not maintaining themselves properly. Please understand this point. These husbands today, you find many of them, they always say to their wives, you know what, You're not, you don't look like how you were when you were in that wedding, yes? She looks and she says, what do you want me to do? Try and look after yourself. You don't look like that day, the wedding day, the way the dress fitted you nicely, yes? Habibi, when was the last time you looked below your stomach, yes? He's walking around, stomach sticking out like this. He's like, you know what, I tell her to look. Have you looked at yourself in the mirror or no? As in you walk around, have you seen your stomach, how it comes out or no? Baba, I'm not telling you to have a six pack. I'm not asking you for a six pack, yes? But the six packs we have in the Muslim community, what are they today? Two pack pizza, two pack chips, two pack. And those, there are some communities, their diets leave a lot to be desired. For goodness sake, who wakes up and has pie at six in the morning? You explain to me the mind of the human being. Or in every wedding has to have a biryani dish that could have more oil than Kuwait today. Correct or no? You look at the person, you're like, Habibi, what's wrong with you? And so, what's wrong? Are you trying to stick the whole oil into your world? Or they are not happy until what? They are not happy until the dish has meat, yes? And you find Amir al-Mu'mineen being the complete opposite. Ali ibn Abi Talib, what is the dishes? He used to have the hardest bread. Today, the healthiest bread is hard brown bread. Correct or no? White bread is not healthy. Brown hard bread is healthy. Amir al-Mu'mineen, never white bread. Always brown, healthy food. Always looking after himself. You think he can ride in Jamal and Safin with his stomach sticking out like that? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, trim. Kumail, trim. Ammar bin Yasir, trim. When they walk around the community, their health is not just their ibadah. You see someone in the mosque, biggest guy in the world, yes? And he's telling you, I'm very religious, pious, mashallah. I love Islam and azadari and so on. Habibi, look at yourself in the mirror. You're far away from Islam. Don't bring Islam to us. Islam is a balance of physical as well as spiritual health. Rasulullah doesn't want people who are just spiritually healthy. Dua, 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 dua. Habibi, go to the gym. That will be much more benefit to you than your duas, yes? Go, sign up, look healthy. Because your wife, if she is not seeing you healthy, her eyes are looking at who is. I'm going to be very frank. Today, we live in a world, the movies dictate our imagery, correct or no? When that wife, 30, 40 years ago, all she had seen was you. Yes, you were a Casanova for her, yes? 
When she saw you on the wedding night, she was like, this is heaven. Today, she looks at those actors in Hollywood and Bollywood. She's like, what have I left myself with? La ilaha illallah, yes? Those actors, yes, someone might turn around and say, but Sayyid Ammar, these actors, it's all Photoshop. Or oh, it's not real, even if it's not real. If it's 60% real, the guy still looks good, yes? Therefore, you find that the first issue is what? Maintenance. If a person doesn't maintain themselves, hygiene. You know, Rasulullah doesn't allow istiraf on any issue, correct? Except perfume. Every other area, israf is not allowed. Perfume, you're allowed to be someone extravagant. Why? Because Rasulullah knew perfume is the essence of love between two people, correct? Keep yourself hygienic. When you come to the mosque, do you know how many people come to the mosque, you smell him, you're like, Habibi, you smell of garlic and onions. Go and get yourself a perfume and aftershave, looking after yourself. The Muslims we have in the world today, wallah, some of them, you don't want to bring him to the non-Muslim because if the non-Muslim sees him, the non-Muslim will be like, what's wrong with you people? You live in a stone age or what? Therefore, maintenance, number one, health, physical health, appearance, looks, these will prevent a divorce. Number two, dialogue between each other, yes? If I enjoy something, I will talk with her about it. But when she enjoys something, let me listen as well. I enjoy, for example, football, correct? I know she doesn't enjoy football. I'll talk about football all day long. But at the same time, I'll talk about Liverpool and Liverpool and Steven Gerrard and I'll talk about Steven Gerrard all day long and I'll talk about Daniel Sturridge and I'll talk about the whole of the Liverpool team. But I know she's looking at me <laughs> and she's not understanding a word I'm saying, yes? Likewise, when she's talking to me about something, I can either switch off or I could do what she does to me. Yes, yes, mashallah, yes. And continue the conversation. Rasulullah said, an hour of dialogue with your wife is greater than a whole night of ibadah in my mosque in Medina. Notice how he said an hour. More than that, it's a big headache, yes? <laughs> an hour of dialogue with your wife is greater than a night of ibadah in Medina. I beg all of you, don't we all want to be near his grave in Medina, correct or no? Don't we all want to sit near his grave in Medina? Don't we all want to read dua in Medina? He says one hour of dialogue with your wife. Do you know why? Because that dialogue opens up your feelings. Sometimes you may not realize your wife is falling into a dangerous area and you can't see the symptoms. If you don't engage in dialogue, she's trying to open herself to you, but you're not listening. And therefore today, when you see the divorce cases, you ask, what's the problem? We don't talk to each other. Talk to each other on areas of your interest and her interest. I remember there was a joke. They said that there was this person, his interest was bridges. You know bridges, yes? You go to countries, there are these big steel bridges. Every time with his wife, all he would ever talk about was bridges. And she would smile because she loves him. He'd say, have you seen this bridge? The way they built this, the way they built this. One day she said to him, Habibi, all you ever talk with me about is bridges. Can't we talk about something else? He said, yes, we can talk about anything. And then he brought it back to bridges, yes? He noticed that his wife, he noticed that she wasn't happy. So one day, what did he do? He turned around to her and he said, listen, let's go on holiday. I booked a romantic weekend away. He said, where? He said, to her, San Francisco. They reached San Francisco. They had a lovely time in San Francisco. And then he said, tonight, I'm going to take you under the moon. Tonight, I'm going to take you out. They went out. They reached the San Francisco Bridge. And standing there, she's standing there. And he says, look up. And she looks up. And he looks up. And she looks up. And he looks up. He says, do you see how beautiful that is? And she said, I've never been so romantic in my life. I could see the moon shining. He says, do you see how beautiful that is? And she says, yes, I do. He said, I wonder how much work took the construction of this bridge. She's thinking, he's talking about the moon, he's talking about the bridge. And that's what happens when there's no dialogue, then what does it lead to? It leads eventually to that divorce. Number three, what's the third issue? Make sure they know that when their parents started in marriage, they don't have what they have today. Likewise, when you start, don't start straight away wanting to keep up with the Joneses. There are too many who want bright lights from day one. Ask your dad and mom, did they have bright lights on day one? There has to be that sense of patience. And that's why you find when you come to that area, 
you find that our school and other schools in Islam differ when it comes to divorce. You see, there are some schools in Islam, what do they say? They say if a husband looks at his wife and he says to his wife, talaq, 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 because they've had a fight, that's a divorce automatically. Me and my wife have a fight, yes? If I say to a divorce, 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 is that kind of divorce? Someone might turn around and say, that's impossible. Other schools outside of the school of Ahlul Bayt believe on the basis of Umar ibn al-Khattab's opinion that if a person says to his wife, Talaq, 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 you are divorced, you are divorced, you are divorced, that's it, marriage over. No Mawlana, no witnesses, no nothing. And do you know what happened? Do you know in Saudi Arabia and Emirates and Dubai, they've had people get divorced from the announcement from the shopping center. In the newspaper, there was a person who got divorced. Which announcement? Do you know what the announcement was? He was unhappy with his wife. They had a fight with each other. So the announcement was made. He said, uh, excuse me, Talaq, Talaq, Talaq. Announcement in the mall. Talaq, Talaq, Talaq. You are now divorced. That's it. She can't do anything about it. And that would affect Sunni fiqh for many years. That many of the ulama of Ahl sunnah had to grapple with this issue. And that's why when the Sultan divorced his wife with the three-pronged divorce, Allam al-Halli had to resolve the issue for him. Sultan, in the time of Allam al-Halli, had a fight with his wife. You know, you have that spat. When he had the fight with his wife, he had that fight and he said, Talaq, Talaq, Talaq. The next night, he missed his wife. Yes? He missed his wife. So he thought to himself, how can I get my wife back? Some ulama told him, according to the fiqh of Ahlul Sunnah, she has to marry someone else. Consummate, divorce, then come back. He said, so you're saying I can't go back to her? No. You must be joking. I love my wife. No, you can't go back. He said, is there any school I can go to that can help me get back to my wife? They said to him, there's one school, the Rafidah. And what an honor it is to be called the Rafidi. The Rafidi means the rejecter. We weren't called Shia for years. We were called Rafidis. ISIS today, when they put the letter Ra on houses in Iraq, that means Shia in there. They don't call us Shia, they call us Rawafid. What an honor it is to be called a Rafidi. My rejection remains rejection till today. And you know who I reject. Tabara runs in the blood. So he said, is there any school? He said, yes. Which school? He said, the Rafidis. He's like, listen, I don't care what their name is. Bring that Mawlana, I want my wife back. Alam al-Halli came, when Alam al-Halli came, took his shoes off, carried them with him. Normally people leave their shoes outside. Carried the shoes with him. And he came towards the Sultan. When he came, everyone was bowing. Alam al-Halli just said, Salaamu Alaikum. He said, excuse me. Why didn't you bow when you said Salaam to me? He said, we in the school of Ahlul Bayt don't bow to anyone but Allah. He said, why have you brought your shoes in with you? Why don't you leave your shoes outside? He said, I would have left my shoes outside, but in the time of Rasulullah, the Hanafi stole his shoes. The Alim who was sitting next to the Sultan said, look how stupid these Shia are. Look how stupid the Rafid are. There's no Hanafis in the time of Rasulullah. They came a hundred years after Rasulullah. Allah al-Hay said, sorry, 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 sorry. Malikis, they stole Rasulullah's shoes. Another of them said, look how stupid they are. There were no Malikis in the time of Rasulullah. They came 150, 200 years later. Allah al-Hali said, sorry, sorry. Shafi'is, they stole Rasulullah's shoes. Allah al-Hali, they said, look how stupid. Came a couple of hundred years later. He said, now I remember. The Hanbali stole his shoes. He said, look how stupid they are. The Hanbalis came a few hundred years later. Allah al-Hali looked at the Sultan. He said, if all those schools came after Rasulullah, then which school was there with Rasulullah? Wow, 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 wow. 
Let's have a second louder salawat, please. A third with even louder voices. Alam al Halli therefore told him, listen, if Hanafi and Maliki and Shafi and Hamali came after, there's only one school that was there with Rasulullah. The pure school, yes? The school that held on to Al Muhammad. Then he said to him, listen, I want my wife back, yes? He said to him, you can have her back. He said, how? He said, I said, Talat, Talat, Talat. He said, in school of Ahlul Bayt, you don't just say divorce, 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 and it's over. The community gets together. You get two judges to sit with each other. Two people of respect. Don't go to two Mawlanas, by the way, yes? You don't have to go to Mawlanas. Get two people of respect, two people of wisdom. Because not everyone with knowledge has wisdom. Anyway, so you get two people from the community together. You sit them down. You sit the couple down. You have a separation period. Don't show the way to talaq. Separation. Don't live with each other for a few months. See if you miss each other or no. If after that they don't want to be together, then the school of Ahlul Bayt says talaq can be done. Now, nikah in the school of Ahlul Bayt. How many witnesses do we need in nikah? How many witnesses need to be in the mosque for nikah? Two, four. No, you don't need any witness for nikah. These two, you just make them feel important that day, yes? Come here, sign. The poor guy is not known for anything. You make him happy that day. In the school of Al Bayt, nikah, you don't need anyone. Talaq, you need two. Talaq, why do I need witnesses? Why can't I just do talaq quickly? Because Allah doesn't want talaq to go that quick, yes? Think. Sit back, sit back. I tell you, and I'm sure the Mawlana's here will tell you. We've been in more than enough cases where you'll find, someone may ask, why the girl is not allowed to have talaq in her hand? I've dealt with cases where if the lady was allowed to have talaq in her hand, I promise you there'd be a talaq every day in this world. That's not me attacking woman. A woman Allah gave her attributes the man can never have. The warmth, yes? The compassion. The emotion, but sometimes that emotion could go overbearing. Tell him I want talaq. Tell him I want talaq. Tell him I want talaq. Then a few days later, tell him I love him. One minute you're telling me I want talaq. Now you're telling me I love him. Yes, I was emotional, but you could have finished the relationship. Ahlul Bayt said what? There has to be two witnesses. Those two witnesses shouldn't just come straight away and say, okay, where do you want me to sign Mawlana? No, I should ask. Who are the two getting divorced? Try and patch them up. Try and make, you know, the only time, one of the only times you're allowed to lie in fiqh is to make two people come back together. Lying is haram, correct? When it comes to marriage references, for example, a, people can do, a person can do ghiba. Otherwise, normally ghiba is not allowed. When it comes to making two come back together, you can lie. You could say, do you know how much today he told me he loved you? He didn't say anything, the guy. He was quiet the whole day. But you make her feel like you want to come back together, you're allowed. Ahlul Bayt said what? You're allowed two witnesses. The two witnesses come there. And even further than that, what did they say? They said after the two get divorced, there is an idda to be observed, correct? In that idda period, the two of you are allowed to still come back and get married without nikah. Your sister and her husband get divorced. If the idda is raj'i and you can return, does your sister need to do another nikah during the idda to get back to her husband? No, just a touch between the husband and her, they're back together. Do you know how many people in the Muslim world don't know why Idda was there? Idda number one, to see if there's a pregnancy from the marriage, yes? Number two, to try and hopefully within those few months, the two can come back. If you as a parent can see that your child wants his wife back, your son wants his wife back, your daughter wants the husband back, don't put your emotion ahead of theirs. You see the boy wants her, help him get back. I send this as a message to every parent. You could see your boy misses his wife and you know who caused the issues. Don't let your ego get in the way. If you see your boy is sad, go talk to him, let him get back. Aida was there, not so that three of you, that it's over. Idda was there so that you may reconcile 
come back. Try and find a way you two can talk again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want you to forget each other. He wanted a chance for both of you to possibly forgive each other. But some ladies stand around and say, well, we, can we have the right of divorce? Of course you can. A lady in Islam can divorce her husband. In which situations? One situation is the khul'a divorce, yes? The khul'a divorce, what is it? The khul'a divorce is a lady may come to Rasulullah like she did. Like Jamila or Rabi'a bin Pas'ud came to Rasulullah said, Ya Rasulullah, I, my husband is a good man, but he's short and bold. I don't have any attraction to him. Can I divorce him? Rasulullah said, are you willing to give back the garden that he gave you? She said, yes. He said, very well. Because she said, I can't fulfill my Islamic duties to him. There's no physical attraction. She was allowed the khul'a divorce. Khul'a means what? The woman asks for the divorce, but she has to give mahar back and expenses possibly above mahar. Then there's a second type of divorce. What is it? The Mubarak divorce. The Mubarak divorce, what is it? When the woman asks for the divorce, her and the husband reach a stage of aversion to each other. They don't want to be around each other. And she says that I'm willing to give my mahar back. Khul'a will be mahar and more. Because the husband may demand more. And the Mubarak, no, you may say, for example, according to different ulama, the mahar will be given back. Then there's a third, which is what? What if my husband is being a devil in this relationship? He hits me and beats me and hits me and beats me. We take it to Mawlana. He says, Mawlana, I love her. He gets back home and he says to her, you see, Mawlana, number one, sees that I love you. Number two, my family has. And your family doesn't. And we have him in our pocket. You can't win. She can't win in this world, you're right. Qiyamah, she'll win. Or you be a dictator in this world, don't worry. This world was made for you to be a dictator. Keep being a dictator. There's a Qiyamah, you'll be shown like this. The ulama realized there are many husbands when they are hurting their wives, not giving talaq. Is it fair that that lady, the husband five, six, seven, eight years is away, doesn't maintain her. She keeps going to a different Mawlana, one after the other Mawlana says, sorry, I can't. Mawlana, but that man is not looking after my rights. I can't. It's his duty, his rights. He's the one who can give talaq. Until ulama like Sayyid al-Sistani, may Allah lengthen his life. And others came and said, listen, if the husband's not giving the divorce and he's not maintaining the wife and there's no way of even changing him, if the local Mawlana is not giving you, come to the representative of the marja, he will allow the hakim al-shara' to give talaq for you. In the past, no one was informed of this. And therefore, many wives lived under zulm. Daughters lived under zulm. And instead of the fathers, you know there are fathers out there, you know they say, doesn't matter if he hits you, I just don't want there to be a divorce because what will the people say about us? Your daughter is being beaten and you're concerned about the people? So say the Sistani has a ruling. That if you are not being maintained and your husband is not giving you talaq and no one's giving you talaq, come to the representative of Sayyid Sistani, wherever he may be, and you go there, you write. They'll call the husband. If he answers and he says there's a chance to change, then alhamdulillah, they'll try and work together. If not, that hakim al-shara will be the one who will say divorce done. In other words, those who thought the woman has no chance of divorce, think again. If a woman wants to divorce and give her mahar back, give other expenses back, or even go to hakim al then the woman is able to do that. And that's why you find Rasulullah would try as hard as to tell the people, divorce may be allowed, but it's the worst halal in the eyes of Allah. But would you believe even Allah told his prophet, if you want, you can get divorced. 
Someone will say that's impossible. Look at Surah 66 verse 5. Surah Al-Talaq is which Surah? Surah 65. Surah 66. Surah Al-Tahreem. Aisha and Hafsa caused so much trouble to Rasulullah that Allah said to him, divorce them. If I say that, people will say, how dare you say that? Aisha is Ummul Mu'mineen. I didn't deny. Aisha is Ummul Mu'mineen, correct? Ummul Mu'mineen means what? In fiqh, she cannot marry anyone after Rasulullah because she is to the believers like their mom. Secondly, you're right, she's, she is Ummul Mu'mineen. But whatever titles you give in hadith, I look at Quran. Quran Surah 66 verse 3. The Prophet told his wife a secret. She went and told her friend. The Prophet told her, why did you tell your friend? She said to him, who told you? Wait, wait. وَإِذَا سَرُّ النَّبِيُّ إِلَىٰ بَعْضِ أَزْوَاجِهِ حَدِيثًا فَلَمَّا نَبَّأَتْ بِهِ وَأَظْهَرَهُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ عَرَّفَ بَعْضَهُ وَأَعْرَضَ عَنْ بَعْضِ فَلَمَّا نَبَّأَ بِهِ قَالَتْ مَنْ أَنْبَأَكَ هَذَا Who told you I want to tell the secret to my best friend? When you tell the Prophet Muhammad who told you, you are questioning the noble law of the Prophet. And what do you call someone who questions the noble law of the Prophet? I won't say. It's better for the human mind to know. She said to him, Hafsa, you know what? This is recorded in Bukhari, by the way. Rasulullah told Hafsa a secret, daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab. She went and told Aisha, daughter of Abu Bakr. If I am lying about what I'm saying, and I know this video is on television, and I know this lecture is on YouTube, if I am lying about what I'm saying, about Aisha and Hafsa, may I be perished. Everyone listening to this video, go and research the two women who Allah revealed ayahs about their behavior. As the poet says, if one disrespects Muhammad within the Quran, it's no surprise that she fights the son-in-law of Muhammad. She went and told Aisha, Rasulullah told Hafsa, why did you tell your friend? She said, who told you? He said, Nabani al-Alim al-Khabir. Allah the Almighty has informed me. Then Allah said, In tatuba ilallahi faqad sagat qulubukma. If both of you repent to Allah, then your hearts are inclined. When tabahara alayhi fa inna Allah wa maulah wa jibril wa salih al mu'mineen. If however you two try and fight our Prophet, know that Allah is his master. Surah 66, verse 3, 4, 5. Know that Allah is his master and Jibreel and the righteous one of the believers. You know who that man is. Then listen to this ayah, all of you. Asa rabbuhu in talaqa kunna. Talaq. Talaqa kunna. Asa rabbuhu in talaqa kunna. Yubdilahu azwajan khayran min kunna. If Allah wants to, he'll divorce you and he'll give wives better than you two. Condemnation.com Asa Rabbuhu in talaqa kunna an yubdilahu aswajan khayran min kunna Muslimatin, mu'minatin, qanitatin, ta'ibatin, abidatin, sa'ihatin, thaybatin, abkara He'll give Muslim wives to Muhammad. No, he'll give Mu'min wives to Muhammad. No, he'll give pure wives to Muhammad. No, he'll give virgin wives to Muhammad. No, he'll give submissive wives, which means everything you are is the opposite of these. Five ayahs later, Allah says, Verily, we give the example of Nuh and Lot. They were both married to women who died as kuffar and who are burning in hell. When someone comes and tells me, you can never chat about the wife of a prophet because she is his wife. I turn around and say, my Lord himself said, Nuh and Lot's wife in the same surah are in hell. And Allah does nothing by coincidence. Rasulullah, why didn't he divorce them then? Because Rasulullah knows if I divorce, then my whole ummah will find it easy to divorce. I will remain patient. And you know how patient he had to remain with these? 
And there's certain things I can't go into on Mimbar, yes, for the sake of the safety of the Muslim world, yes, because us followers of Ahlul Bayt, the moment we talk about history, the world attacks us. Because the others aren't allowed to learn history, yes, we're the only ones who talk about history. But you know what Rasulullah said? He set a principle. Try and remain patient like I remain patient. Don't go straight into talaq. These two have attacked me. Allah has allowed me to do talaq. But try and remain patient. I remain patient. Secondly, in Khadija, he gave us a role model for the best of wives. Yes? That she remained loyal to him. She was submissive. She wanted to dedicate her life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from Khadija, you had the ladies of the 10th of Muharram. One by one. You study each and every one of them. And each and every one of them took Khadija and Fatima as a role model in their life. They could have divorced their husbands, couldn't they? Could not Rabbi have said, I don't want to come with you, Imam Al-Hussein? Could not Layla have said? Could not Ramla have said? Could not Bibi Zainab have said to her husband, I want to divorce you? They helped Abba Abdullah give the greatest victory. But each one of them gave a great sacrifice. Each one. Wallah, when you come to those nights, when you hear Layla and her words, when Akbar falls, or Ramla when she sees Qasim fall, or Zainab when she sees Aun and Muhammad fall. But there were some wives, if it wasn't for them, their husbands would never find Jannah. Rabab, her husband, is the master of Jannah, correct? Layla, her husband, is the master of Jannah. Daylam, wife of Zuhair ibn al Qayn. And Wahab al Kalbi's wife. Wahab was the Christian who became Muslim, yes? You know, when he wanted to fight, when he wanted to fight his wife at the beginning, she was standing there. And he said that I want to fight alongside Abba Abdullah. When he said, I want to fight alongside Abba Abdullah, you know what she said? He said, Wahab, we've only been married 17 days. He said, but the son of Fatima is Zahra is alone. When he came out to fight, his mom, his mom said to him, MashaAllah, my son, you have honored me. And he came out to fight. He was about to fight. He turned around because he knew that he had just married his wife. He turned around to her. She said, Wahab, don't go. He said, let me go. As he moved forward a bit more, she said, don't go. He said, let me go. As he moved forward a bit more, she said, Wahab, go out and fight. He wondered, why has she changed her mind? He turned around to her and said, my dear, why have you changed your mind? Wallah, her reply breaks my heart. She said, Wahab, I heard the tears of the children of Abba Abdullah shouting, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. That was the first answer. The second answer was what? Wahab, go out and fight. When, she, when he said to her, why? She said, you know, when I was telling you not to fight, I turned around, I saw Abba Abdullah standing alone like a stranger. <laughs> May Allah bless your tears. I couldn't take seeing Imam al Hussein alone like that. That was one wife. She pushed her husband. But I tell you, Daylam, wife of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, that lady pushed Zuhair to become one of the greatest companions. Because you know, there's some historical opinions that say Zuhair was not meant to be with Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Then Abba Abdullah called Zuhair. Zuhair had wanted to avoid Abba Abdullah, some historians mention. So they called Zuhair. And then Zuhair was walking around his tent. He had gone to meet Abba Abdullah. Then he came back. And then his wife looked at him. She said, Suhair, what's wrong with you? You look confused. He said to her, Hussein, son of Ali, calls me. She said to him, she said to him, Suhair, Abba Abdullah calls you and you stay here next to me. The son of Fatima Zahra is alone. You stay next to me. 
this affected him. And I tell you on the 10th of Muharram, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn put up a fight. Some historians say no one fought like Zuhair ibn al-Qayn on the 10th of Muharram. All those Sahaba were special, but his fight was immense. When he came out and he said, Ana Zuhairun wa Ana ibn al-Qayni, adribukum bisayf an Husayni, inna Husayn an ahad al-Subtayni, min ajrat al-Nabiyy al-Zaki al-Zayni, thaka Rasul Allah ghayr al-Mayni, ya layta nafsi qusmat qusmayni. He would say, I am Zuhair and I am the son of Qayn. I strike you with a sword on behalf of Husayn. Surely Husayn is one of the Subtayn, from the purest, most noble of lineages. There I see Rasul Allah in front of me. I wish my body was cut into pieces. And I tell you, they chopped his body into pieces when he fell. And he called out, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. And you found Aba Abdullah. When he came out, he said something he never said about any other companion. He said, Ya Allah, raise the killers of Zuhair as pigs on the day of judgment. Yes? Because they absolutely mutilated his holy body. But I leave you with this narration. One of the Maraja, when he heard this narration, he broke down. He fell unconscious. This is how difficult this narration is. On the night of the 11th of Muharram, some of the ladies, they were missing their husbands. Some of them were missing their brothers. Some of them were missing their fathers. So they were all together in the tents. Dayla and the wife of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, she remembered Zuhair. She began to cry, yes? So you know what she did? She called her servant. She said to her servant, oh my servant, come next to me. The servant came. She gave the servant a piece of cloth. She said to the servant, Oh servant, go out on the plains of Karbala and go and cover the body of Zuhair. The servant went out. The servant looked around. And then the servant came back. She looked at the servant. She asked the servant, Oh servant, did you cover the body of Zuhair? She said to her, No. She said to her, Why? And the reply hurts every lover of Abba Abdullah. And she said, as I was about to cover the body of Zuhair, I saw the holy body of Abba Abdullah with no cover on it. I thought to myself, how can I cover the body of Zuhair when the body of the son of Fatima Zahra lies on the ground with no kafan on it? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلم ينقلبون واللعنة الدائمة على القوم الظالمين We pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى to build strength in the marriages of our communities Ya Allah, keep divorce away from our communities Allow us to live in peace and prosperity with one another Ya Allah, shower us with the grace which you showered on Rasulullah and Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam Ya Allah, shower our youth with the grace you poured on Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Surah al-Fatiha But before it, the loudest of your salawat Allah.